welcome, welcome to To The Point. Uh, today it's just me. Um, we're going to be talking about God, time, and our resurrection bodies. Now this is really, really interesting. There's a little bit of physics involved, but not too much. Um, I'm going to try and keep it very simple, but the thing is that we are all going to be resurrected. And we're going to go through something called an event horizon. Have you ever heard of an event horizon before? Well, I tell you what, there are lots of event horizons in the Bible, and I'll be describing them. And I'll be describing how Jesus went through an event horizon, and also how all of us will also go through an event horizon when we're either raptured or we die. This is not a discussion about whether we are raptured or we die, uh, but whatever happens, we are go we're going to have resurrection bodies. And when we get into, when we inherit those wonderful new resurrection bodies, uh, we are going to um, go through an event horizon. So I'll start off by just very simply explaining what an event horizon is. It's just a time when the normal laws of physics cease to apply. Um, and from the point of view of this particular conversation, when time ceases to exist and we go from, from this earthly existence to heaven in our eternity body, in our eternal bodies in a place where there is no time, in eternity. It's a very, very interesting subject, so I would hope you stay with me for the next 26 minutes. And we'll look at the, quite a lot of slides. So if we look at the first slide now, and um, the first point I want to make is that God actually lives outside time completely. It says in Isaiah 43, from eternity to, eternity to eternity, I am God. It says in Revelation 1, this is Jesus speaking, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end who was and is and is to come, the Almighty. So um, the point is that God lives in eternity. And again, going to Isaiah 57, verse 1, it says, For thus says the High and Lofty One who inhabits eternity, whose name is Holy, I dwell in the High and Holy Place. In other words, he dwells in heaven, but he inhabits eternity. So I'm going to try to introduce to you today this concept of eternity. And we're going to start with uh, creation. Uh, if we go to the next slide, a picture of, of the solar system. It says, very well known scripture, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And in the next picture is a picture of the solar system. Um, that's not all the solar system, that's just part of the solar system which God created. And all, uh, there's a next picture, is a picture of planet Earth. Um, that's excellent, that's a picture of planet Earth where we live now. Um, and all matter is made of atoms. If we just show the next picture, I'm just going to point out some things about that. That's um, one atom. And I don't want to get too involved with nuclear physics, I'm no expert myself, but you'll notice that the center is a nucleus. And that consists of a proton and a neutron. Now, a neutron has no charge at all, but a proton is positively charged. Whereas all the electrons whizzing around the outside very, very fast, um, they are negatively charged. Now, I wonder if you just come back to me and look at me now, just for a second. Um, I want you to imagine um, cam uh, magnets with a north and a south pole. What would happen if you got a magnet and with a North Pole and a South Pole, and put them together, they'd go, dong, wouldn't they? They would attract each other. Well, if we can go back to that picture now, if that's possible, you've got there uh, a picture of an highly charged uh, negative electrons whizzing around at very high speed around a central nucleus, which is very positively charged. So I've got a question. Why does the whole atom not implode? Well, the, the, uh, no evolutionist has got the answer to that. Nobody's got the answer to that. The, the answer is actually in the Bible. It's in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, and I'll read it to you. They're talking about Jesus Christ. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. So if you come back to me now, God, uh, God actually upholds the whole universe he stops the electrons imploding, imploding into the central nucleus by the word of his power. Other translations say the word of his command. Now we're told in 2 Peter 3 that one day the whole universe will dissolve in fire. 
I don't know exactly how that's going to happen. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. But here is a suggestion that simply God withdraws the word of his power and all those electrons which are whizzing around the central nucleus suddenly implode so there is no more universe. It's dissolved in fire. I don't know that's the case, but that is a possible case according to theoretical physics. Now we're going to move on to time which is something not often discussed uh, by students of the Bible, but it's actually terribly important. So I want to, to look at the next picture, which is number six, uh, an image of proton, uh, sorry, photons. Pho uh, time are actually, time, sorry, forgive me, light is actually subatomic particles uh, moving at the speed of light and made of uh, uh, that very, very small, moving in a wave form. And of course, we don't see photons, uh, what happened was God said, let there be light. It's in Genesis 1-3. Uh, God said, let there be light, and then there was light. What he created were these subatomic particles called photons. Now, what we see, we don't see photons. We move on to the next picture, which is a rainbow. Uh, we see um, a rainbow, which is basically seven different colors split up. Now, normally we see white light, but after a rainstorm or maybe using a, a spectrum, a, a prism or a spectrum or something like that, we will see a rainbow. Now, you remember that God is a God of sevens. Seven, seven days in the week, seven colors in the rainbow, seven notes in music and seven throughout scripture. That's why there are seven colors in the rainbow. And God created light at the very beginning. Now, I want you to look at the next slide, which is image number eight. I don't want you to get too involved, too concerned about new, uh, physics, but if you look at the next picture, image number eight, E equals mc squared. Now that is Einstein's law of relati relativity. And what, it's, uh, what Einstein discovered is that energy equals mass times the square of the speed of light. I'm gonna say that again. Energy equals mass times the square of the speed of light. Now, I want to uh, emphasize speed. Speed is a measurement of time. So when God said that there be light, first there was mass, and then suddenly uh, there became, uh, the energy was created in the form of light. So if you look back to me now, energy uh, actually came in, sorry, energy and light came into existence when God said, let there be light right at the very beginning of creation. Now, I want you to, I want to try and explain, if you look at me, it's something very simple. Actually, it's, not, it's as simple. Here is my watch. Here is a plastic box, and this watch tells time. You see, we live in a three-dimensional world. Uh, I'm, living, I'm in a studio right, right now. There's height, width, and depth of this studio. And there's something else called time. I look at my uh, wrist and here's the watch and right now it's whatever time it is. I'm going to put this watch in a box and put a lid on it. Now I've just put that watch in a box and that box represents the fourth dimension which is time. And God, don't misunderstand me, I'm not saying I'm God, that is just a representation. God lives outside time which means that he can see everything that's ever happened and ever will happen. For example, he saw you and chose each one of us before the creation of the universe. He sees us now and he sees you now watching television. He also sees you in heaven right now because God lives outside time in eternity where there is no time. There are actually 11 dimensions, but the fourth is time. And God created, uh, for the, yeah, the fourth is time, and God created time. He came from eternity to eternity, and he created time. Right, let's move on quickly. Um, that's the next picture now, which is number nine, the creation of the earth. Now, the point that I want to make here is we're told in Ephesians chapter one, God chose each one of us in him before the creation of the world. So before uh, the universe existed, God chose each one of us. Um, and when time ceases to exist, uh, and we, we, after we, our spirit leaves our bodies, we will find ourselves, next picture, number 10, in heaven. And God, believe it or not, can actually see us in heaven right now. Right, I'm going to just spend just a quick uh, little uh, time on uh, predestination and free will. 
Now, there are lots and lots of conversations, uh, discussions amongst Christians about predestination and free will. If you just show the next picture now, which is number 11. Uh, lots of discussions about uh, good choices, bad choices, predestination and free will. Um, if you haven't heard about predestination and free will, it doesn't really matter, because it doesn't really matter much. It, if you understand that God lives in eternity, he sees everything before, um, before it happens, he knows all the choices we're going to make, then there is no discussion about pre predestination and free will, because God knows what decisions we're going to make even before we make them. He knows the number of our days, he knows, the number of our de he knows what decisions we're going to make. So the, this whole discussion about predestination and free will is purely a man-made discussion. It simply doesn't understand that God lives in eternity and knows everything uh, in the future, in the past, in the present, and he knows also what decisions we're going to make. Right, our next picture, number 12. <clears throat> Jesus actually um, has pre-existed pre all of creation. And he actually said uh, in the New Testament, in John chapter 8, he said, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. So I am actually is the name of God, and he was saying that he pre-existed Abraham. That actually upset the Pharisees and the Sadducees, him saying that they thought that was blasphemous. Now, in the New Testament, if you look at the next picture now, um, Nathaniel uh, was very surprised when Jesus said uh, in John chapter 1 uh, that he saw Nathaniel under a fig tree even before he met Nathaniel. Which means that literally Jesus Christ saw Nathaniel sitting under a fig tree, um, I don't know whether it's minutes or hours, before uh, Jesus actually met him person to person. Which means he knows each one of us um, before we were created. He knows what happened half an hour ago, one hour ago, a year ago, and ten years in the future. He knows everything about us. Uh, let's move to the next quick picture now. Very well-known one. This is uh, Jesus talking about the future as far as Peter concerned. Image number 14. And, and there's uh, Jesus talking to, in Matthew 26 to Peter. And, and this is what Jesus says. I tell you the truth, Peter. This very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times that you even know me. So there's, um, there is uh, Jesus telling Peter what's going to happen in a few hours' time. Jesus could equally uh, know what's going to happen in the future, uh, uh, all the future for all of us. Um, now, there are some amazing, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but there are some amazing prophecies in the scripture. For example, Psalm 22 describes the crucifixion very well, but I'm not going to go through, uh, through Psalm 22. Instead, I'm going to go to the next picture, which is uh, Jesus coming to Jerusalem in image 15. Um, I'm in Daniel 9, verses 25 to 27, is a mathematical prophecy to the very day when Jesus Christ would actually come to Jerusalem. If we look at the next picture, this is written by uh, Sir Robert Anderson in a very famous book called The Coming Prince. And Sir Robert Anderson was superintendent of Scotland Yard, but he was also a student of Bible prophecy. And this is one of the foundational um, studies of uh, prophetic scripture in the Old Testament. And in this particular scripture, if you just look at me now, and basically uh, what it says in this book is that if you uh, count from the actual day uh, when the order was given in Nehemiah chapter 2 in 445 BC for the walls of Jerusalem to be rebuilt, then you add on 173,880 days and you come to the very day when Jesus would come to Jerusalem in 33 AD, to the very day. Now that is a mathematical prophecy which is correct to the very day. And by the way, the, um, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees knew all about the book of Daniel and they would have known exactly who Jesus was, that he was the coming Messiah, who by the way will be executed not for himself, it says in the same scripture, um, they would have known exactly that Je who Jesus was and that he was the Messiah just from Daniel 9. Now, God is actually in control of time completely. Uh, if we look at the next picture now, 
Um, this is just an image of Joshua's long day. Now, I don't know if you've heard about Joshua's long day. It's very interesting. Um, in Joshua 10, verses 11 to 13, um, basically Joshua was uh, having a, f uh, a battle. And he was having a battle against one of the uh, tr local tribes called the Amorites. Um, and it was going to take an awful long time for this battle to happen. So guess what happened? Uh, God actually stopped time completely. I'd, if you just look at me just for a second now, I'll try and explain this to you. The point is that at the equator, the, the Earth is spinning on an axis at 5,000 miles a second. Really fast. We don't notice that. <laughs> We're whizzing around through space as well, even faster. But the point is that um, it wasn't that uh, God just stopped the sun in the sky. We're told in the scriptures that God stopped the sun in the sky for nearly a day, nearly 24 hours. Um, if you imagine traveling in a car or a spaceship or a train at 5,000 miles an hour and come to a screaming stop, guess what's going to happen? You're going to go through the windscreen very fast, even if you've got seatbelts on. No, what happened, what must have happened, is God stopped time completely. And that is really important. God stopped time completely. He stopped the planets, he stopped the sun, he stopped the moon, he stopped the earth, he stopped everything. So everybody was living in a little bubble where there was no time. Uh, that's how much in control God is of time. And just to prove the point, we go to the next picture, uh, which is number 18. Um, this is recorded in Isaiah 38. Um, King Hezekiah was dying and um, Isaiah the prophet came along and gave him a sign that he would not die but live for another 15 years. Um, well, Hezekiah was a little bit doubtful about this and said, well, I want, I want a really good sign. Not that the sundial goes forward. I want, one, I want God to give one a sign that the uh, sundial goes backwards. So guess what God did? He removed time from the whole universe by moving the sundial back 10 degrees on the sundial, which is about 40 minutes. So God can stop time completely. He can move it backwards, forwards, and do anything he like with it. And when we come to eternity, there will be no time at all. Now I want to introduce you now to Event Horizons. Now, um, that is, if you go to, uh, if you Google Event Horizons, you're going to find a lot of information about Event Horizons from nuclear physicists in particular. Um, some of you may have heard me talking about the Shroud of Turin. I'm not going to be talking about the Shroud of Turin right now. But there is a, a famous uh, nuclear physicist um, called Isabel Pixek. I'll be talking about this on a different program, who says that the, what actually happened on the Shroud of Turin was an event horizon when time stopped. However, what I am going to do right now is to try and describe to you event horizons from the Bible. Let's look now at image number 20. Now that is an image of Jesus being, who was surrounded near Nazareth by a crowd of very, very cross um, Pharisees and Sadducees. And I'll tell you where it happened. If you look at the next picture, image number 21, that is a cliff that I've been to very near the synagogue in Nazareth. In fact, I was there last year with Revelation TV. I've never been there before, though I've been to Israel many times. But that is a very, very steep cliff. Now, if you come back and just look at me, I'll try and explain to you what I think must have happened. We're told about it in Luke chapter 4. And this is what it actually says in Luke chapter 4. And they got him, that's the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they got up and drove him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went his way. Now, here's the situation. Jesus had just read from the book of Isaiah and basically said that he was the Messiah. As far as they were concerned, he should be killed there and then because he was uh, actually being blasphemous by saying that he is God. So instantly they took him straight to the brow of this hill, very close to Nazareth, and tried to throw him off the top. Now, um, there's no question that Jesus was very fit. 
Um, he wasn't a carpenter, he was a builder. The word tecton means a builder. But I, I, I want to be real about this. What are the chances of a very fit 30-year-old um, uh, strong builder to prevent himself being thrown off the top of a cliff by a crowd of about 60 really, really cross Pharisees who are intent on killing him? Well, I suggest to you God the Father stepped in here and stopped time completely. So they, they were like statues, and Jesus simply walked straight through them. Because I can't, in all honesty, think of any other reason why, how this could have happened. Now, this is pure speculation, but I did actually share this with Tim Vince. Some of you know Tim Vince quite well. And he agreed with me this is probably the most likely uh, reason for this. Let's move on now to the next picture, which is number 22. That's the transfiguration, when again eternity and, um, eternity and time came together. We're told in Matthew 17 that Jesus, is, Jesus shone like the, his whole body shone like the sun, and Moses and Elijah were there from eternity, but Peter, James and John from the present time, they saw Jesus in his resurrection body. This was an event horizon. What about this next one now? Elijah, Elijah taken up to heaven. That was an event horizon when, when something supernatural happened and basically time stopped while this fiery chariot took Elijah up to heaven. Um, now what about us? When we die, next picture, we're going to go to heaven. That's the next picture of heaven. Um, and as I said, this is not a picture of whether we're, I'm not discussing whether we, uh, we're going to be raptured. That's the next picture, number 26. Maybe we'll be raptured, only God knows that. Or maybe we'll be resurrected, like the next picture, number 27, like Jesus was. I don't know, but one way or another, something extraordinary is going to happen. And I wanted to give you, a, just, just in closing, an idea of how this is going to happen. You see, we are a human being, and in each of us has two things. First of all, a spirit. Next picture, that's curly and photography. Our spirits probably don't look anything like that. It's a representation of our spirits. Each one of us has a spirit. And that's something that God gave us right at the very beginning, when God said, let us make man in our own image, man and female created he them. Now, God is a spirit, and when he created something in his exact likeness, he created another spirit of Adam and a spirit of Eve. But he also created the next picture, which is number 29, DNA, uh, which is uh, the genetic code of which our body is made. Our body is composed of 66 chemicals. Um, and if you look just to me now, in uh, Genesis, sorry, in um, Genesis chapter 2, it says, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into him the spirit of life, and man became a living being. This spirit that God created before time began, he breathed into uh, this six foot long for, um, formation of 66 elements uh, and Adam came to life as his spirit entered his body. What happens when we die? Let's just look quickly at image number 30. Jesus died on the cross. It said, Father, Jesus said, Father unto you, I commit my spirit and he died. His spirit left his body and he died. Next picture. Um, this is another picture of uh, Jesus healing a, a little, or raising to life, a little girl, Jairus' daughter. And he said, uh, little girl arise. And it says her spirit came back into her body and she came back to life. Now one day our spirit's going to leave our bodies and we're going to be resurrected. And God has actually provided an idea of what's going to happen. In in our natural world. Let's look at the next picture. It's a picture of caterpillars and chrysalises. Um, and something extraordinary happens to them is that after a certain time, they change into butterflies, completely different bodies. But I'll tell you something really extraordinary is, is the DNA of butterflies is identical to that of a, a, a the, the, the DNA of the butterfly is identical to the caterpillar and the chrysalis before. So are you looking forward to living in eternity in your resurrection bodies? I hope you are. Uh, in image number 35, are, you're going to go through an event horizon. 
And we're going to be welcomed by Jesus into heaven. Number 36, we're going to be welcomed by Jesus in heaven. It's been lovely to, uh, to join you on To The Point. Uh, I hope you're enjoying these programs. Do write to us at To The Point at Revelation TV. And if I don't meet you before, I will meet you in eternity. Uh, we ought to just measure our days because when the book of Job, it tells us that God knows the number of seconds in our lives. We ought to make sure that we live our lives every second for Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for watching. Lovely to talk to you. Thank you for joining us and see you again next week on To The Point.